Hi everyone. Um, my name is Ellen Walter um, from IRC. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, if you haven't done so already, please introduce yourself in the chat box. Um, we're um, looking forward to a really exciting webinar that we have today. Um, just so everyone knows, the webinar is being recorded and we'll share the recording as well as the PowerPoint presentations with everyone after the fact. Um, so we're, we're excited that you're all able to join us today and um, we're going to start. Um, so you, to make sure you're all in the right place, this is the Systems Approach to Hygiene Behavior Change um, webinar um, where we're going to be talking about lessons um, that um, several organizations have heard across um, WASH, health, and education. Um, so the, the purpose of this particular webinar, um, as the title says, is to think about um, how we take systems approaches um, to hygiene behavior change. Um, oftentimes within the sector, we're hearing about systems approaches to water, sometimes sanitation, but oftentimes um, hygiene is left out. And so we're, we're really excited to start the conversation here and to hear some of these examples. Um, this is part of um, a, a webinar and event series that um, IRC um, that IRC um, has been collaborating with multiple organizations um, to, to talk about different systems approaches. So we're very excited um, to be partnered with the Global Hand Washing Partnership um, for this webinar. We have three presenters today, and for time savings, I'm going to do um, their introductions now um, and um, so that we can just continue right along. So our first presenter um, is Lauren Yamagata, who is the Agenda for Change Knowledge Manager, as well as Partnership Support for IRC here in the United States. Um, in the past, she has worked for Plan International USA as a program associate on the water, sanitation, and health practice. Um, Lauren has a master's in international development studies from George Washington University and we're very excited to have her here with us today to be talking about um, the building blocks. Our next presenter um, will be Megan Williams. She's a senior manager of behavior change at Splash. She joined in two, uh, 2013 and leads the global design and development of their health and hygiene program, environmental nudges, um, teacher and parent engagement, and related research. Prior to Splash, Megan worked as the program manager for Pencils of Promise in Laos, where her areas of focus included WASH and education. She has a Bachelor of Science degree from Western Washington University in community health. And while she's not singing hand washing songs um, with kids around the world, you can find her in the mountains skiing and hiking with her family. Um, Dr. Om uh, Prasad Gautam is uh, a public health expert and behavior change scientist and the senior wash manager um, for hygiene in Water Aid UK. Um, he is, a, um, a, as I said before, a public health expert and behavior change scientist with more than 17 years of work and research experiences in the wash sector, um, including environmental health, behavior change, child health, immunization, food and hygiene safety, diseases, surveillance, and HIV and AIDS programs. He holds a PhD from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in the UK, and two master's degrees, one in public health and the other in social sciences. He currently works at WaterAid UK as a senior wash manager for hygiene, and he's the global lead for their hygiene behavior change. He previously worked at various international organizations, including the World Health Organization. He's passionate about the role that WASH and hygiene behavior change in health play in human development and brings his skills to the development sector to improve health, hygiene, and well-being of the poorest and most vulnerable groups in low and middle income countries. So super excited um, about everyone joining. In the room, we have here um, myself, Ellen Walter, and 
Hi everyone, this is Carolyn Moore with the Global Handwashing Partnership. I'm excited to welcome you all and we'll be facilitating a discussion later on in the webinar. So um, any comments and questions are very welcome throughout. We'll take just one or two clarifying questions after each short presentation to make sure that we have time to get through the content and, and have a really good discussion. So please enter your questions, comments, perspectives at any time. We'll take a couple after each presentation and then we'll have a, a good chunk of time for discussion at the end and, and really look forward to hearing from all of you. Thanks. Great, thanks. So moving on to our first presentation, um, Lauren, we'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Alan. Um, so I just have a few slides to get things started. Um, obviously, I think we really want to focus in on um, the hygiene portion of the day and the lessons we have from um, Ohm and Megan. Um, but just to get things started, um, I'd like to share these slides. Um, for those of you who are familiar with IRC, you've probably seen some of these images or all of these images before. Um, but IRC is really focused on um, the wash uh, through a systems approach. And we understand a system as a set of things working together as parts of a mechanism or interconnected network, a complex whole. Um, we take a whole systems approach, which is informed by our understanding of the water sector as a complex adaptive system consisting of multiple actors and relationships, all of which need to work together effectively for services to be delivered. So you'll see on the left-hand side of the screen um, a representation of the system when it's working effectively with all of the factors and actors at different levels varying from the community all the way to the international, working together towards a common vision of delivering WASH services to everyone. On the right-hand side at the top, IRC's role uh, we see as acting as a hub, aligning people and organizations through a structured change process. A hub can help to manage the focus of the partnership towards certain visions and outcomes. And then at the bottom, we see our specific approach um, to make the process work. Uh, we are developing a vision at a very local level through diagnosing the issue. We're testing solutions to see what's working and seeing what's working in the system. And then we're working to scale up what we, what we find that works, all while involving people that are needed to make and keep that system functioning. And through this process, we need to invest lots of time in building trust among these different actors. The WASH system is made up of factors and actors, and understanding the behavior, motivations, and incentives of these factors and actors is essential. The building blocks are a way to break down the complexity of the system and understand how these factors and actors interact. So for those of you who've been involved in WASH systems work, there are different organizations um, that have established uh, building blocks ranging from anywhere from 5 to 13. And IRC has chosen to focus on these nine. These are some of the essential elements to make the system function from policy and legislation, uh, looking at the specific policies in the sector and the, the framework that is um, the, the legal framework in each country institutions, including the capacity of uh, those who are able to, to uh, implement the infrastructure where the majority of our sector has often focused on specifically building and creating um, water assets and water sanitation assets, monitoring from both the framework and how we use the information that we're gathering, planning um, at different levels, both at district and national finance, how money is flowing in and out of um, the system and through different sources, regulation, and of course, water resources management. And through this whole process, IRC sees it really important that we are learning and adapting um, throughout, the, throughout doing this work. Next slide. 
Um, so what's important for us to note here is how the WASH system is not standalone, but actually part of the broader political economy in any country. This is key to our discussion today to see how it overlaps with other systems, including health and education, how they interact, and how the WASH system can work together with other systems to deliver WASH services to everyone. And so with that, I'd like to um, see if there are any questions for clarification, and if not, turn things over to our two main presenters. Great, thanks, Lauren. Um, does anyone have any, if you have any clarification questions, please type them in the chat box, um, and we'll, we're happy to answer them now, but Lauren will be, um, will be around also for our discussion. Um, so, uh, there is a question, thanks Chris, uh, from Chris McGahee, can the building blocks be applied in failed or emergency states, or does it require a certain level of government? Uh, thanks Chris, and Ellen, I think you can also help me on this one as well. I think that um, we would like to, um, there are certain amounts that can be done in failed and emerging states, but we really are trying to work through um, those, those governments that are there. Obviously, in those types of situations, the government is often not there or not functioning, so there, there is only um, so much that can be done. Um, and just, just to add, I think, to that, um, that um, in order to, you can, as Lauren said, address certain elements of that, but um, what we're looking at um, in addressing the system is to improve and build, as Lauren said, on the existing system. And so when there is no system at all, so if it's a completely failed state, that makes it very difficult. And so I think elements of the system, such as infrastructure, um, but looking at the entire system itself, um, and how those things interact is difficult if there's no level of government um, functioning at all. Uh, any other questions for Lauren for clarification before we move on? Great, so we're gonna move now to um, Megan. Um, Megan, um, I'm gonna turn over to you. Just let me know when you'd like to advance the slide and please continue to type your questions in the chat box for the discussion um, at the end. Megan, over to you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, there we go. Well, I'm really thrilled to be talking with all of you about this topic. It's, uh, it's something that Splash has been exploring more seriously over the last couple of years. We've always partnered and worked with the education sector, different ministries, um, but now we've really started to unlock the potential for transformational change that can happen across a larger population using those schools as the catalyst to broader change. So that's what I wanna to talk to you about today, where we work, why we view schools as that potential. Next slide. Next slide. There we go. So when I started working in the development sector, the image that came to my mind of a place that needed WASH programming was the image on the left. Um, you imagine someone who's walking miles each day for water, often that it's unclean. There's very little to no sanitation facilities, no soap. Uh, and that made a lot of sense because in 1950, 75% of the world's population lived in the countryside. And while there is still an incredible need for WASH programs in rural areas, it's predicted that that same 75% is now moving into cities. So 75% of the population will live in a city by 2050, which is a complete swap. Next slide. And so what that looks like today is that every single week, three million people are migrating to cities and a large part of that population will reside in slums. It's a striking number to imagine that every single week, three million people are moving into these cities that are already uh, oversaturated. Next slide. And that is slums where access to safe water toilets, hand washing facilities can be abysmal. It's hard to believe that this is a point of access for water for some people, that 
every week they might be coming here to try and uh, fill water jugs to bring home and have that as their main source. Um, it's very much so a band-aid to a much more systemic problem. And that's where Splash has found our place of trying to address that. Next slide. So Splash was started in 2007, and we have always had a laser focus on addressing this gap in the sector of focusing on cities. We specifically want to make sure that children living in urban areas have access to safe water, sanitation facilities, and hygiene. And we've found that the best way to reach the most kids is through schools. Each city has a huge amount of government schools housing hundreds of thousands of the poorest kids. And these schools are embedded throughout a city. So it gives them the potential to act as a hub to the larger population. And that's what we've really started to hone in on and trying to explore. Next slide. So really quick, just take Kathmandu as an example. There are 2.5 million people that live in Kathmandu. This is one of the smaller cities that we work in. Many of those are living be below the poverty line. And then take that next same image with the next slide. Take that same map with markers to indicate the schools where Splash has worked. We are scattered across the entire city. The government schools span the city. We can use those schools as the access to those surrounding communities. And in fact, uh, in 2015, when the earthquake took place in Nepal, we found thousands of people taking refuge in the schools. And they were utilizing the splash water systems and stations because those were accessible and available to uh, all of the people that were across the city. Next slide. So this is really why we believe that schools are at the center to broader community change. And we see that happening in four different ways. Uh, one is that it can be a distribution center. Another is that you can um, train and mobilize children to be change agents. A third is addressing market gaps by providing affordable services. And the fourth is reaching scale through government partnership. So what I'm going to do today is kind of dive into each one of those for you and talk about how we could leverage those. Next slide. So first is the distribution center. Um, this year, Splash has been working under the WashPals grant for USAID to evaluate nudges in two different contexts. One is at schools, where we are comparing the implementation of nudges to a control, as well as to the combination of nudges and hygiene promotion. Um, and it's an interest, really interesting study. It's less relevant to uh, this conversation here, but we'll definitely be happy to share more with that in another um, offline. Uh, but more relevant to this conversation is the second study, which focuses on household behaviors. So in Ethiopia, parents visit their children, their children at school a minimum of two times a year. They always have to go there for registration, for uh, collecting grades, but then also I did a handful of interviews with parents and a number of them are going every other month to be able to make some payments or get information from the school. So there's a lot of touch points that parents have with those schools. So what we wanted to do is it made, it made us ask the question, how can we leverage this existing touch point to influence their wash behaviors at home? So we designed a study in which we'll be distributing a nudge package to 120 households during one of those parent meetings and comparing that to 120 households as a control. And we want to try and understand if this method of distribution and these nudges, which includes a hand washing barrel, a mirror, and a soap tray, if those can have an effect on hand washing behavior. And some of the design for this was informed from Ohm's work in Nepal. So I'm really excited for you to have a chance to learn from him about his program next. Um, we'll be running this study over the next year. So we don't have results yet, but we'll be sure to share those once they come in. Next slide. Uh, the second is viewing children as change agents. I, 
I know there have been some healthy debates on this topic in the past, and we have been on both sides of wondering whether that the children can really have strong impact in their broader community. Um, we're always eager to hear if anyone on this call might have evidence of children's influencing their families. Um, but just this year, there was a qualitative study that was done at 35 households, and 26 of those had received a splash intervention, nine had not. And while it's a small sample size, the results were quite striking for us. Um, there, it was found that 85% of the households with a splash intervention at their school had soap present at hand washing stations. And that is compared to only 33% at the control schools, control households, I should say. Um, and there were similar results around the knowledge of hand washing steps. Intervention households had around four out of the six steps. They were able to recall those. And then compared to only 1.8 of the control schools. And even though it's early data, it is very promising to us to imagine that uh, school-wide soap drives where we are asking students to request soap from their, their parents to bring that to the school, um, hygiene club training, school-wide events, engagement with teachers and PTA, that that may actually influence household behavior is incredibly exciting. Um, we're eager to explore this more, but for now we are feeling optimistic. Uh, next slide. The third opportunity to leverage schools towards broader change is market penetration. We've already gained a strong reputation in the community and that's through our work with the schools. So combining that with a kiosk model and a price point that is actually affordable to the poorest homes, that means that we can ensure necessary access to safe water around the clock for kids. Um, and next slide, I'll share a little bit more details about that. Next slide, there we go. Um, so it is still a pilot pro program for us. Uh, we've launched nine kiosks across Kathmandu Valley, but we've seen 2.2 million liters sold, 16,000 revenue, revenue, 9,000 in profit. And the really promising part of this is that it's not only providing that safe water to kids and families at their homes and reaching out to the broader community, but it also is generating a profit for the schools to sustain their system and kind of closing that loop on a sustainable model. So this image of the kiosk here, this would be at a school and there's going, there would be a kiosk operator that is running it from the school. So any profit beyond expensive maintenance for it can go back into the school. Next slide. Um, a final piece which Splash views as crucial to long-term success and scale is strong government par partnership. And Lauren touched a lot on this, um, that WASH does not stand alone. It requires navigating and working across many different ministries. And we have absolutely experienced that. If we have a school that doesn't have access to water, it's not actually the education department that's going to address that. It's the water and sewage that's going to address that. So Splash is needing to act as a hub to try and see collaboration across these ministries for a broader goal that is a, a collective vision that we have. Um, they are the ultimate influencer that can enforce adoption and finance that sustainability. So we've also been focusing on work to try and make sure that there's line items within these budgets to sustain the systems that we might provide. So this year, the Department of Education in Kolkata India requested that Splash provide a citywide training on hygiene for 1,500 schools over the span of five months. <laughs> for us, it's a very audacious goal. Um, our team in India is in the right in the middle of it as we speak, and our effort to scale a training program has been at a turtle speed compared to the push the government was able to mandate. So we really acknowledge and see how um, that partnership with government can really launch you into a scaled program. Um, the key focus for that training is equipping the teachers to mobilize resources, gain support from school management committees and PTAs, um, and have that broader reach and collaboration with the communities. 
um, and most importantly, to change the behaviors of kids. Next slide. So what's next? Uh, some of Splash's priorities over the remainder of the year are conducting further household research to better understand existing infrastructure, behaviors, and what are the barriers for some of those behaviors. Uh, from, what, from that, we will be running pilots and then be, try to formalize a standard around our household intervention of how do we use those um, schools as the leverage point. Next slide. And Splash has set our target for 100% coverage. Looking back, we just accomplished our goal of providing clean water to every government orphanage in China. And now looking ahead, we are focusing on 100% coverage of full wash in government schools across three mega cities. So that's Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, Kolkata, India, and Kathmandu, Nepal, which will reach over 1 million kids by 2023. So Splash believes that for true systems change, it can't be done in pilots scattered around the city. We need full saturation if school wash is to become the norm and if it is to become demanded by that community instead of seen as a luxury. Uh, we believe this shift in norm at, in combination with access, uh, children as champions and government promotion can be what moves the needle on household wash within a city as well. Next slide. And as I said in the beginning, uh, these are all areas that Splash is exploring. And while we believe we are best poised to take these questions on, given our focus in cities, we're eager to learn from others, um, to understand the ways that other people have used schools as catalysts to change or other avenues for scaled interventions. Um, to, today, I didn't spend as much time on our intervention itself because I really wanted to focus on um, schools as that catalyst, but please take a look at our website um, and then you can get a better understanding of our full WASH package. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, so um, based on the time that we have, I think we're going to hold the questions um, to make sure we have time for the discussion at the end. And we're going to move straight in um, to we, we did see the questions in the chat box, everyone. So we will come to those in the, the discussion, but we're going to move straight into um, uh, Om's presentation um, so we can make sure we get through that and have some time for discussion. So um, Om, I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, and please um, go ahead. Great, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It might be good evening somewhere. Uh, on behalf of WaterAid, I would like to welcome you all in this presentation. Um, I am sure many of you know WaterAid. This is, WaterAid is an international charity. We work in 38 uh, countries across different uh, parts of the world. Uh, for today, uh, my discussion, though water would exclusively focus on water sanitation and hygiene, for today, my focus will be on hygiene behavior change. Uh, but within hygiene behavior change, one is specific areas where we work with uh, health sector, particularly uh, integrating hygiene into child health programming. So I'll be picking one example specific to this uh, discussion just to contribute the, the broader discussion here. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm sure this is needless to say to everyone, WAS is very much fundamental and basic foundation for any development. WAS is directly linked with Sustainable Development Goal 6 and also linked with many other development goals. Uh, here in Watford, our vision is to um, offer safe water sanitation and hygiene for everyone everywhere by 2030. If you look at the left, uh, the slide uh, in the left hand side, what we do have in our new global strategy, we do have four strategic aim. Um, out of those, one of which is hygiene behavior sense. Why we focus on hygiene behavior sense is because we know that this sector, water sanitation and hygiene sector has been traditionally taps and toilet sector. And we fail to maximize the benefit of our investment on water supply sanitation without focusing on, on behavior sense. The sustainability aspects of was compromise if we don't focus on behavior sense. The other is the M is integration. And we do believe within water that was 
though is a core function business and accountability lies within water sanitation and hygiene sector but it has to be integrated in any other development work including health education private sector livelihood therefore in today's discussion i'll be focusing on how we integrate hygiene into health next slide please okay why we focus on this of course as you can see diarrhea mortality is still the unfinished business if you look at the data since 20, 2005 to 2015 huge reduction more than 40 percent reduction on diarrhea mortality but if you look at the diarrhea morbidity only 10 percent reduction from 2005 to 2015 it's because the the countries has been more responsive in terms of treating treating the patients rather than preventing it if you look at the global strategy to prevent diarrhea who says that should be a comprehensive strategy to prevent diarrhea the comprehensive strategy does include treatment the the vaccines as well as prevention which is water sanitation and hygiene if you look at the global um, uh, priority now that is a global push from WHO and UNICEF to introduce new vaccines, which is rotavirus vaccine in the countries where diarrhea is highly prevalent. When it comes to vaccine, people believe that vaccine is a silver bullet. If you inject, everything is gonna be perfect. Imagine a situation, there will be a new vaccines called rotavirus in the name of diarrhea in any countries. Then I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar. The rotavirus vaccine is just one third cause of the overall diarrhea let's say 30%. The vaccine efficacy, the protective effect of that vaccine in low income settings where sanitation is low, the behavioral compliances are low, is just the, for up to 47%. So what happens if any country decides to implement rotavirus vaccine, if government decides to do that, what happens? If government able to immunize 100% of the target population because of vaccine efficacy and nature of the disease, only 20% of the children will be protected from overall diarrhea. Let's say, imagine you are a mother, you are going to vaccinate your child with the rotavirus vaccine. What happens? You vaccinate your children, second very day, child will have diarrhea. You might think, oh, the vaccine doesn't work. You will have the mistrust on the overall vaccine. At the same time, it is gonna be a missed opportunity. Therefore, in order to personalize the overall what uh, WHO recommended strategy, at the same time, two, position how hygiene can be integrated into ongoing routine immunization system when there is an uh, introduction of new interim vaccines like rotavirus, cholera, or typhoid. We actually initiated an innovation. Um, that's the innovation that I'm going to present, which is integrating hygiene promotion through routine immunization. Next slide, please. Okay. This project is actually aiming to demonstrate how hygiene can be integrated into ongoing routine immunization system. At the beginning, we are actually conscious, conscious about um, the making it more simple, attractive and appealing so that it can be scalable nationwide. So by implementing this project, we really want you to address four key questions. One is, is the approach is going to be effective in changing behavior? If we integrate hygiene alongside the routine immunization campaign, the vaccination campaign, is it effective in changing behavior? It will benefit to immunization program because immunization is a very successful program in many countries. So the question is whether it will benefit to the ongoing immunization program. Third one is whether it is going to be cost effective and feasible approach to scale up nationwide. And Fourth is whether it will enhance the capacity of the health workers. Otherwise, it's going to be, um, it's not a scalable approach uh, if this is not going to strengthen the capacity of the sector. This project actually implemented in four districts of, again, in Nepal. Thanks, Megan, highlighting the Nepal, another case. And I think we are bombarding with the Nepal case today, but this is uh, related to health. The previous presentation was on and, and education. So this one, this project was implemented in four districts when I say four district is the full district coverage, targeting 35,000 mothers with a young child um, from zero to 12 months. And we have mobilized around 2,200 female community health volunteers and around 1,200 health workers to implement this program uh, in four district. Next slide, please. So it was, a, it was the first time 
um, for what way to implement this. And this is in fact, and it's uh, for the first time happening uh, worldwide. Um, so therefore we, we really want to do it thorough in terms of our approach and in terms of our program design and implementation. Of course, the one thing I, I definitely would like to emphasize here, when it comes to hygiene behavior change, people often think, oh, hygiene behavior change is a difficult undertaking. It's very difficult to change people's behavior. It's difficult if people are using a cognition model of behavior change. If people are using, let's say, telling, I mean, there's a cognition model, meaning if people are using kind of traditional method where the, the hygiene promotion is actually teaching people rather than motivating them. If people are using just posters, form plate, or wasting money on printing caps and t-shirts for the name of like implementing behavior change and thinking and evaluating it, oh, if it's hard to change, it's not gonna work. So therefore we really wanted to bring more innovation and creativity in our design and implementation through this project because we really wanted to be I wanted to see whether this approach can actually work so in order to do that in order to design implement and evaluate it we have used a behavior center design approach using a ABCDE principle what we have done we have done the scoping studies just to understand whether government of Nepal the Ministry of Health is ready um, uh, for this approach once the government is ready, after scoping a study we identify that one publish the paper in the international journal and then jump into the form research and through the formative research we try to understand the determinants of the behavior the motivational drivers the the touch points the barrier for people why people are practicing the way they are currently practicing we have done all of these and prioritize key behaviors from formative research and then we enter into the creative process to design the intervention package through a creative process and implement this project over time which is one year and then evaluate it baseline and inline and compare the results so in my subsequent slide i'll be focusing on abcde just very brief so that I'll give you a crux what had happened throughout. Next slide, please. Okay. In 2012, we have done the scoping study. Just wanted to see that whether there is a interest within the, within the government. Um, the, the, the findings concluded that the immunization is a missed opportunity. We should not miss. But we were not sure, the government wasn't sure, how can it be implemented so that um, the, um, the it can be scaled up. So therefore we have done the scoping study, published the paper in the international journal, signed the minister, uh, MOU with the Ministry of Health, and we have established a technical support unit on behalf of Watford, we have established an office within the Ministry of Health to support them to run this project. It's part of the B. Then we start building our understanding by conducting a formative research. As I said, the determinants, the motivational factors, the driver for behavior change were collected through a formative research. We have also assessed how routine immunization happens and what are the priorities, what are the touch points within the routine immunization through which we can engage with the, the target audience. Through the, the, the formative research, we then prioritize five key hygiene behavior that are critical to, to, um, to break the transmission cycle for fecal pathogen, at the same time to maximize the benefit. Those behaviors include exclusive breastfeeding, food hygiene, and washing with soap, water and milk treatment, and hygienic use of toilet and child feces disposal. If you look at this behavior, these behaviors are sequenced according to child life. Up to six months exclusive breastfeeding, and then the six months they start gonna they, they are gonna start the winning food that has to be thoroughly cooked and reheated before feeding. They need to wash their hands, and alongside food they are also gonna feed water and milk that has to be treated, and the child feces need to be disposed. So these behaviors are actually sequenced according to child life cycle. Next slide, please. After the formative research, then we started uh, designing an intervention package. After, often what happens in the sector, there is a mislink between conducting a formative research and just rushing to pick one idea and then start implementing the intervention. But based on our learning, then we commissioned a curative process. The curative process meaning bringing a multidisciplinary team on board, people from private sector who has the social marketing skills, people from from production company, the social artists, the curriculum design. So we have commissioned this curative process, the bringing a multidisciplinary skill in the table. Based on the formative research, we have sort of generated lots of emotional drivers and the whole package was designed um, linking with some of the emotional drivers for behavior change that includes discourse, notes or affiliation instructors. And then we also use the concept of changing physical setting. In, in the previous presentation, uh, Megan mentioned about putting a nudge. That's the concept of putting, a, um, disturbing the physical environment. We have developed through this creative process, we have developed the prototype package and we train the female community health volunteers and health workers to implement it. And, uh, and um, the whole campaign was branded 
uh, the whole campaign uh, it's, it has its own identity and it has own desire whole campaign was designed as part of the ideal family concept and we have the thorough hygiene promotion package to be implemented next slide please so now D, so how, how do, after the package uh, design, how do you actually deliver? So we have used the government routine immunization system. The hygiene session are delivered before vaccinating children. As I said earlier, the sessions were every month, there was one specific session related to hygiene, uh, in particular uh, immunization clinic. We have targeted 35,000 mothers and each mothers, each sessions were actually lasting for 45 minutes before they actually get into the, into the vaccination session. Next slide, please. So how it works? So if um, if a mother had a new child, they have to visit health center at least five times to vaccinate the children. Every time they come, let's say if they are coming to vaccinate the BCG or DPT1, DPT2, DPT3, including polio and measles, they will be exposed five, um, with the hygiene session. So that means routine immunization offers a five opportunity to engage with the hygiene session. So it's not one of exercise, it's a multiple times where mother can actually be exposed with the, with the behavior change intervention. Next slide, please. So um, the, we have designed the package as part of the delivery. So the package has lots of exciting, attractive elements. Uh, there, are, uh, there were ritual for the campaign. Um, then we have lots of activities. Every time mother will come, they will be exposed with different activities just to make it more appealing and desirable for people to join. The, the, the activity includes storytelling, illustration, games, competitions, surprise letter, the the different context is not about cognition it's not about telling it's all about engaging them through an event and inspiring them to become an ideal family towards the end by immunizing their child fully at the same time practicing behaviors next slide please the whole hygiene sessions were actually happening in the in the immunization clinic but behavior, most of these behaviors happens at the household setting if there is nothing for mothers to put as a takeaway and um, put in their house as a reinforcement mechanism of course there will be no uh, reinforcement for mothers to continuously practice those behavior so at part of the campaign design we have branded different items like a mirror you can see here one of the uh, picture uh, the, the 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 mirror at the middle and five behavior uh, the branded mirror with the five behavior illustration so that we encourage in the individual households to put this um, mirror in their house when they are seeing this faith it reinforces the behavior the other side in the left hand side you can see a beep with a message called did you ask your hands before feeding me and we distributed this imagine a mother putting this beep in the child chest rather than distributing a left left and another is fan in fan we have five behaviors again and the other side of the fan is the immunization schedule where mother can actually see when they should go vaccinate the children so these are behavioral noises we actually place in a behavioral settings to in order to rein reinforce the behavior Next slide, please. So those are a few exciting tools um, uh, we have used uh, in addition to the full full package to reinforce the behavior. So what's the outcome? E. So the the effect of the intervention was what's quite um, um, uh, uh, the the um, uh, quite strong both for behavior change and for immunization. So our primary outcome of interest was behavior change, whether the integration can actually help improving the behavior. We have set up a baseline. We have assessed the behavior. Um, you can see I, we have assessed knowledge, reported behavior, and observed behavior. The composite performance of the mothers, the mothers performing all five behaviors during baseline, the observed behavior only 2%, and it went up to 53% after one year implementation. And we have evaluated with the 15 months gap of one year implementation. So there was a significant improvement on behaviors. So next slide, please. The the uh, the immunization coverage has been increased significantly as well. But uh, I just wanted to flag that though we haven't uh, positioned to measure health as a primary outcome, health I mean diarrhea was a secondary outcomes. Um, but I, we can see there was a trend on, on reducing the diarrhea prevalence um, over time in all the all the district. Though we are not claiming that the attribution is coming from this uh, project, but there was a reduction on diarrhea as well. Uh, just wanted to flag that. I mean, this is a secondary outcomes, uh, but the overall um, uh, the findings for the other indicators like immunization coverage and strengthening the health worker capacity, it was also positive. The campaign also strengthened the routine immunization coverage. The timeliness and compliance was high. At the same time, it has strengthened the, uh, the female community health volunteers capacity, and they now feel confident to roll out these events independently. Uh, next slide, please. 
that might be my concluding slide just to sum up the the summary lessons is immunization of course um immunization program is going to be uh, is definitely a unique opportunity for integrating hygiene and this project actually demonstrates the real integration often what happens in the sector we often think oh the coordinates i mean I mean, the integration is 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 um, uh, is needed, but we don't have the solid example, and this project actually offers the 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 opportunity and to do that and demonstrate the effect, and um, the integration can actually strengthen the system. It's not only improving behavior, but also strengthening the health system, and the major lesson from this particular uh, trial was uh, often people think that the the um, being an expert. On behavior change, people can do uh, design the intervention. That's not 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 um, uh, um, uh, the, the good conclusion. The in order to design an effective intervention, we need to go through a formative research, design the intervention through a curative process, and implement it. And government involvement since the beginning of the program is in, uh, is is uh, is important. And often people think that uh, the government is slow, government system is corrupt. But no, I think we need to we need to deal with this. We need to build the system. We need to sort of you know um, make them accountable. At the same time, if government has the capacity to implement at this scale, I think we have used that that platform as a, as a key for this one and then the in terms of cost the uh, as the as a pilot we have used uh, us dollar 12 uh, for for uh, target beneficiary uh, for the hygiene behavior change intervention in four district but we are now transiting from pilot to to a scale which is now costing six dollar for target beneficiary the next slide so what, what is happening now? The government has now decided, the Ministry of Health, the Thailand Division has now decided to integrate hygiene uh, alongside the routine immunization campaign in all districts. This will happen uh, when the government is ready to implement rotavirus vaccine, which is due in October 2018. Currently, we are working with the government to raise funds because of course implementing nationwide is not a joke. So we are, um, we are working with the government to find the fund. I mean, um, in the call, I can see there are colleagues. If you have interest to join this collaborative effort in Nepal, welcome. Feel, feel free to uh, drop me an email. So the, the next slide, please. The final conclusion from this uh, particular initiative is, of course, we can implement hygiene in a small project and see, to see the, the whether the approach are effective. But if we really want to bring the change, we need to think the, the scale, we need to involve government since the beginning of the inception so that the government feel when your project is successful, government actually own and decide by scaling up. And this project happened, though we call it pilot project, but we implemented in four district at the universal coverage at the scale already. It is a fully tested package, readily available to implement now the settings. And what it is an institution, this is just one example. We implement hygiene program in all of our country programs, and we are now looking the opportunity on the other countries to also scale these uh, particular initiatives but as part of our many streaming initiative hygiene behavior change component we have been um, uh, championing in, in many countries to implement hygiene behavior change program using a behavior center design approach um, uh, through our regular water sanitation and hygiene program i think i'll leave here with this and uh, welcome to the questions thank you great thank you very much Om. i'm going to turn over to carolyn and i'm just going to Quickly flip through back to the slide on um, from Lauren's presentation on the building blocks to get us started. Thanks very much um, for our, our speakers and, and all of the good questions that I see coming into the chat box. Please keep those coming. Um, as Ellen flips back to the building blocks, I want to have those up just for our consideration as we discuss. Um, and, and thank you to our presenters for giving some, some good examples of, of your work, but then digging into sort of the factors that are a little bit less program specific around governance and really how this work is implemented through systems. Um, and if I can, I'd like to come back to Megan with, we have a couple of questions that are specific to the intervention that I'm going to hold off on for now. But one of the things that you talked about that I, I like, think there's interest in digging into a bit more is the role of all of the various actors in the system. In this case, you talked about the education system and the WASH system and then um, how those can collaborate to eventually deliver the outcome that we're looking for. So could you expand a little bit on that and just tell us a little bit more about the actors who are involved in, in your work and, and with the example that you gave, or I know Splash has, has other great examples, and talk a little bit more about the integration of those actors and, and why you see that as really key to success level of your programming. Yeah, um, thank you so much. So 
uh, yeah, as I mentioned, there were a lot of different people and components that need to be collaborating on to be able to see that success. And so, um, and to kind of touch on some of those questions that have been coming in, um, the first piece is the government. And I, I completely agree with Om on that sense of being able to have government collaboration. And the, the largest body that we work with is the Education Bureau. So they really are the driving force, but then they're are other departments which need to be involved, like the Ministry of Finance, the, um, the Water and Sewage, and being able to have that collective goal of reaching 100% coverage is only going to be successful if you have all of those parties that are working together. Um, I really loved, there was another question that someone had about how can we make sure that not only government departments are working together, but also the NGOs themselves coming from a background of being at an education NGO, I think that is really crucial. And so how can we leverage the work and effort that other groups are doing and be able to amplify our success through that? I know there's been work and research on things like nutrition as being uh, having a deeper impact if WASH is in combination. So making sure that we are collaborating with other NGOs to have that partnered effect. Um, similar with, you know, education approaches with the teachers themselves, um, collaborating with uh, design agencies to make sure that our products themselves are going to be durable and strong and also attractive and have a sense of behavior change with, built within them. Um, so these are all different pieces that come together to be able to have a successful intervention at the school level. Excellent. Thanks very much, Megan. And I know we have some good expertise in the um, in the participants at large, so please keep chiming in with your comments. But I'd like to also turn that question to um, Lauren and to Ellen. I know that your work with IRC and Agenda for Change has focused a lot on sort of building synergy and, and making sure that things are moving smoothly across these different different building blocks. So I wondered if you had anything that you'd like to chime in to kind of build on what Megan just said. Sure. Um, so I'll start and Ellen can add as well. Um, I think we saw one one um, comment around this, you know, how can it when we're all working possibly at separate ends or you have uh, maybe government um, turning it you know, taking a different perspective, but I think the idea that IRC um, has and in their participation in Agenda for Change is that um, when we work collectively um, with a common vision, which is, you know, towards achieving these SDGs and, and um, WASH services for everyone um, that are sustainable, um, we come with a common message and it's um, clearer when we're working with government about what exactly our um, our goals are, what the expectations are for them, and how we can how we can work together. Um, while we all have our individual strengths as different um, NGOs, we can put those to use when we when we do come at this with a, the common vision. Yeah, uh, the only thing I would add, I think, is that um, the collaboration that we see that's really essential um, in bringing all these actors together, as Megan said, is. Um, is both at more of like a global level for, for us um, in our participation um, with Agenda for Change. So what are those um, common approaches that we can be sharing and learning from each other? But then also what does that look like at a very specific sub, um, you know, sub-national level at the district? How are, you know, at this very local level where this, the, that's where the system is happening? Um, there's national level systems, as we know, and we want to um, we want to take an active approach in that. But really, where you're going to see the largest change is at this district level. And so, how do you ensure that all of the actors and in, are interacting and learning from each other in a very effective way to make that collective change in the system? So yeah, go on. Great, thank you. Um, I'd like to shift gears a little bit to a question that just came in from Fabian to Ohm, and, and maybe I'll expand it a little bit. So Fabian is asking, beyond sort of the, the project phase of the example that we offered, how can we make sure that this is institutionalized? 
Um, and Om, from, from your work, I know that you um, really did some important work considering some of these building blocks, so considering some of the aspects of finance and regulation um, and institutional capacity, et cetera. So could you tell us a little bit about that and um, not necessarily specific to this program that would, that would be welcome, of course, but really key lessons in once you have discovered or when you're designing a, a very specific intervention in, in your case that has proven to be successful, what are the, some of the key things that needed to be considered up front to make sure that it was set up for success and in terms of institutionalization? And then at the point you are now, what are some of those pieces beyond the intervention itself that you're really working on to make sure this carries forward? Thank you, Caroline. Um, yeah, thank you, William, for the, for the question. I think this is a good question. So um, definitely in terms of institutionalization, this was the key for, for WaterAid to see this project uh, since the beginning, since the inception phase of this project. Um, though we are saying this is a project because we have said this is a project because we wanted to initiate this initiative and test in few locations so that we then see whether this is feasible approach to, to integrate. Having said that, during the inception phase, we uh, inception phase and throughout the implement design and implementation phase, it was the government project, the fully owned by Ministry of Health. After the scoping study, the, the formative research, the design phase, the implementation, all was led by the Ministry of Health itself. What it, our office within the Ministry of Health, our staff sitting in the Ministry of Health and our technical expertise was to strengthen and then making sure that the government feel accountable and um, curate all of these mechanisms in place to implement this project. It was fully owned by the, by the government and championed by the Ministry of Health and implemented through their ongoing routine immunization system. This wasn't the project. This wasn't the kind of vertical implementation. This was part and parcel of the ongoing immunization system in the ministry. So it has already been institutionalized. Whole process was already been institutionalized and government feel, uh, feel confident and, and, and take ownership and leadership in terms of implementing this. It was a little easier because in Ministry of Health in Nepal, they have this uh, five-year health sector strategic plan. And when the, the, there was a strategic plan for and process and what it was actively engaged in terms of fitting into that process and making sure that what is reflected as one of the critical elements within the health and it was already part of the kind of um, um, the the ministerial plan uh, not particular this initiative but also the overall inclusion of was into their planning so it's always i think when it comes to system strengthening and also making sure that different feel different sector feel confident and accountable in terms of rolling it out was it it is essential for us to engage at the policy level, whether there are conducive policy, institutional mechanism in place, and how we feed into that process at the, at, the, at the national level. At the same time, when it comes to designing and implementing it, and we should be looking what are the existing mechanisms through which we can we can implement rather than creating a vertical um, uh, implementation. Otherwise, this is not going to be sustainable. The the other the, the build, look going back to the building block questions. I think for hygiene behavior change, it is quite essential and and uh, quite essential to look these some of these vertical uh, sorry solid build, building blocks. For instance, the institutional mechanism I already described, the infrastructure, the infrastructure aspects is quite essential and fundamental for behavior change um, uh, to be happen. We discuss about nudging, we discuss about the availability of, uh, let's say for hand washing, availability of hand washing facility with soap and water. These are essential ingredients, behavioral products as an infrastructure. Without that, sustaining behavior over time is not possible. So infrastructure aspects, the regulation and the legislation is quite key in order to make sure that the ministry actually feel confident and, and able uh, to continuously commit the, the resources. For instance, we just implemented the, the project and now government has themselves decided to scale up uh, nationwide and they're also putting resources to, to retain the, the ongoing implementation in four districts is because they have this, um, the health sector plan articulating was importance of was at the same time they were they were the uh, one who is actually implementing this as we implement the, the pilot so the, this uh, has to be there and then i think the financing and and then the planning uh, i do definitely agree with you that in the sector often when it comes to finance for was people often think financing for sanitation financing for water supply not necessarily thinking financing for the behavior change for behavior change this is not uh, the i mean this is cost effective 
effective intervention in long run, but it does require a significant amount of money. And we need to allocate that uh, as we as we design. It's, the financing should not be add on activity for behaviors. And it should be parts and parcel of the, of the process. Thank uh, you. I'll list up well, and, um, sorry to have to cut the discussion off here because it, I think it, we're getting into some really great content, but I know we are um, just running over time. So um, one of the really interesting pieces that we didn't get to pick up, but I think is an important point just to acknowledge as well is some great comments that have come in about the roles of um, NGOs and, and coordination and collaboration within that and, and the role that, that those actors play within the system as well. Um, so maybe we can hopefully pick up on that in another discussion. Um, for now, I'll just turn back over to Ellen for some quick closing thoughts and, and to point us to some resources. Great. Thank you, everyone, for joining today. I think that um, we heard some really interesting examples. I think, you know, looking at how we have and capitalize on um, introducing hygiene into existing systems is a really um, interesting perspective. And how do we how do we identify where the ownership lies for hygiene, and how do we all play a role in that? Um, and then the other piece on partnerships, I think, and collaboration um, of all of the different actors and how they interact was great. Um, we have two quick announcements. One is please visit the Global Hand Washing Partnership website. Um, they have a lot of resources around hygiene, a lot of research and other things that have been done um, over many, many years. Um, and so please visit the website for more information. Um, and then also please save the date. Um, IRC is having our system symposium um, in March of 2019 in The Hague. And you can um, find out more information online, but um, we hope that this conversation and the hygiene element um, it's just the beginning of our conversations going forward. And so we really um, look forward to continuing these discussions. We've recorded the session and we'll send around both the recording as well as the PowerPoint presentations. Um, and we hope to hear from all of you about um, any interesting examples that you have on how hygiene has been incorporated into larger systems work. Thank you so much. And we look forward to, um, to seeing you again on the next webinar.